Right, uh, so this is um, a talk about what was known as the Spanish flu. Um, it was followed by well, almost certainly the, the worst plague or illness to, uh, to strike anywhere in the world uh, over the period of a year or two. Um, the, the number of people who were victims who died of uh, the Spanish flu in the two years between 1918 and 1920. Um, the estimated figures have been gradually rising as more and more data has been available from countries that, uh, that, didn't, that hadn't reported anything, but things have been discovered that in fact there are uh, more people that uh, succumbed to it uh, than, than previously thought. Um, at the end of the uh, 1920s, they thought about 20 to 25-ish, 25 million people have died. Um, it's been gradually rising and it's now estimated to be at least 50, 50 million and possibly as high as 100 million. No. So it's, it's a completely different uh, sort of scale to any, any, any other things. Uh, um, more people died in two years than, for instance, the Black Death in seven, uh, a couple of decades. So, um, first of all, I'm sure, is there anyone here who's never had the flu? <laughs> I was expecting that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, around about one in ten people get what's called seasonal flu every year. Um, the, um, uh, and it's normally pretty mild. Uh, most people, uh, I say pretty mild, compared with, um, the, with the common cold, it's pretty severe. Um, but one thing is that generally it's a short, sharp shock. Um, most people feel really, really ill for about three days or so and then start improving quite rapidly. They feel weak after it, but they won't necessarily um, uh, they, they seem to recover pretty quickly. Whereas uh, cold, um, in, uh, if you get a cold, they tend to drag on quite a bit longer, but it's not as bad uh, for the duration. But they can, they can, uh, a cold in, uh, infection of common cold can last for weeks and weeks. So, Spanish flu. Um, what I'm going to do first of all, I'm going to just do a bit of technical stuff about flu viruses, and, 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 and not on, I'm not going to go into it too deeply. But there's a few things, few technical things, which uh, uh, explain what happened uh, uh, when, when I actually get onto the actual flu itself. Um, so, what is a virus? Look at this. This is a, a human hair. Not a good drawing. This is a fungus, like the sort of thing that if you got a, a hairy uh, strawberry or something like that. That's the size of uh, the, the, the filaments of, the, um, of a fungal infection. Bacteria, you can't know, are too small to be seen on a visible, uh, to a visible eye, but you can see it under, these, uh, under a normal microscope. And they're normally either round or just sort of torpedo shaped like that. And this little dot here is the average size of a, of a virus. An awful lot smaller. And they, they're too small to see under, under a normal microscope. You have to have specialist equipment. Uh, like an electron microscope to be able to see it. And this is what a flu virus actually looks like under an uh, electron microscope. Uh, almost round and lots of little, mm. little bits hanging off, <coughs> off, off all the way around it, like, almost like little hairy, hairy bits on it. The other thing about viruses is that unlike bacteria and fungus and humans and other animals and plants, they haven't got the mechanism to be able to produce more versions of themselves. The only way they can do that is by getting into another cell, like a, a human cell that lines the, the back of the throat, and hijack that, that cell's own equipment to be able to uh, produce more, more versions of it. And that's where a lot of the, da lot of the symptoms come, because the, the damage it does to the, to, to the cells it invades. The other thing is, it don't, Viruses are far, far simpler than either uh, humans or animals or, or bacteria. 
um, the genetic material, the stuff that actually uh, tells the uh, uh, acts as a sort of code to uh, be able to make new new proteins and new, uh, to actually make another make another virus. Um, humans have, and other animals have tens of thousands of genes, each each making something that's generally fairly uh, fairly uh, needed by the uh, by by that cell. To, function properly. Bacteria, normally about four or five, four or five thousand. The flu virus, anyone have any idea how many genes there are in the flu virus? Four. Mm -hmm. Eleven. All, all, it, all it has is the, the, what's needed just to make another version of itself. Uh, so it has uh, all the bits that sort of fit together to make to make a make a new ver a new virus. And of course, what happens is when the uh, when the cell is uh, full of the, the has been hijacked, the virus has made loads and loads of copies of itself. The, the cell is already damaged, and then the um, the virus usually does something to split the split the cell open to release itself so it can go off and infect other cells nearby. And that's what causes, as I say, all the symptoms and all the, all, all the, uh, all, all the real sort of damage to the body. Now this is, it's not that colour, this is uh, false colours just to, just, to, just to illustrate what they are. Uh, this is what a flu virus looks like. I actually nicked one of the balls off my dog, which is, uh, it's a, those are not spiky bits. On the, outside, on the outside, and this one's now alive. So, it's, uh, <laughs> and there's a few important bits. Um, and on the outside, there's two very important proteins. One of them, they've both got long names, but we, we'll be referring to it just by their first initial. First one is called hemagglutinin which is the blue ones that are marked on there. And they, that is sort of the key that the, uh, the virus uses to get into a, into a cell. Um, it attaches itself to the, to the outside of the cell and it sets off a reaction that makes the body, uh, the, that cell, drag it inside. So it's sort of like a key to get in. And the red one acts, uh, it breaks down, once there's loads of new viruses inside, that breaks down the inside of the, of, of the barrier to get out and it forces its, forces its way out. Um, that's more like a sort of uh, kicking the door in, trying to get out. The, 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 it's more subtle getting in. The, uh, the hemoglutinin, which is always known as H, and neurodimidase, is uh, is known as N, and that thing they, they crop up very very commonly. You'll hear things in the news saying H1N1 and things like that. They're all important because that's uh, what uh, makes a particular strain of flu do what it does. Inside, this is the genetic material that that's got all the codes needed to make more of these and more of the things that actually hold it all in place inside. Um, it's made of a thing called RNA. Uh, normal cells, animals, human are made of DNA, uh, use DNA. This is um, RNA and it's only a single strand and very short strands of it. So there's, a, there's actually eight short strands and they contain 11 genes altogether. RNA is very prone to be, uh, have errors occur to it so that it changes very, very slightly over, over a period of time. And the RNA that codes for these two proteins on the outside, they, um, it means that the shape of them changes very subtly over, over, over a period of time. Sometimes they can change uh, every few months, sometimes they take longer, but occasionally something very drastic happens and it changes, the, the shape of it changes completely. Usually the body, once it's recognised uh, these, particularly the H, 
on the outside. When the body recognises that, if it's come across it before, it gets rid of it very easily, very quickly. And the thing behind having a, a flu vaccine every year is that they have a, a, a smashed up or dead version of the, of the uh, flu virus which has got these H's and N's on the outside. And by uh, a, flu, a flu vaccine can't cause, a normal, can't cause an infection because it's had stuff done to it to stop it. But then if the body comes across the proper version, it can react far, far quicker. So you either get a very, very mild version of it or occasionally you don't get, get it at all. And that's the whole idea behind the flu vaccine. In 1918, a very major change. As a new virus came, across, came along which is totally different to what any that people had come across before. And it meant that virtually everyone was susceptible to, uh, to the effects of that. And this is like a sort of time scale. Um, I nicked this from a, from a flu vaccine manufacturing uh, site. Um, what usually happens when a, new when a new strain of flu comes along, it, you get an explosion of cases. And then over the, over the next few years, it calms, it calms down and just becomes like a normal seasonal flu. Um, and you can see there's little explosions at the beginning of each of these. The biggest explosion is the H1N1. And uh, that, uh, these two really ought to have a question mark on because it's not actually known exactly which, which, uh, which strain that, that, that was. These have, these have been where people have tried to work out what the most likely strain is. But from 1918 onwards, it's definitely, it was always H1N1. And uh, that, was the, that was the main strain of flu going around until 1957, when the Asian flu epidemic happened. And um, both the H and the N both changed. And they, they changed sufficiently that they gave it a different number. So it's H2N2. In Hong Kong flu in 1968, the end stopped the same, but the H changed again, so it's H3N2. Then something very strange happened in the mid-70s, uh, 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 mid about 1976-77, the old H1N1 reappeared. Um, there's been a bit of speculation as to exactly why, where that came from. There had been a very uh, major earthquake in northern China, uh, about six months or so before that appeared on the scene. And there was speculation that uh, a, a laboratory which had the um, H1N1, the old strain of H1N1, in the, in the laboratory, the laboratory had, uh, had uh, been uh, destroyed by the, um, by the earthquake and it, the, the old strain had escaped. It's never been proven, but uh, this one was known as red flu or Russian flu. Who names but the I say the H and the N just come from the, uh, the mm -hmm. H. The, the very first when they first actually discovered what the H and the N were, they just called it H1N1 because that was the first time. <coughs> uh, uh, there, there, there would be um, doctors or uh, people who uh, deal with uh, the uh, outbreaks of any sort of uh, diseases. Uh, if, provided it's actually got um, sufficiently different, there's normally the, the World Health Organization are usually the people there. And there's a committee there who actually decide the names of uh, the, the subtle changes. Um, they would also be the ones that look at the, it's probably not one individual person, but uh, almost certainly a committee. Uh, the World Health Organization, uh, one of the people, the uh, uh, a CDC, the disease control people in Atlanta, Georgia, are another one, but uh, maybe probably the World Health Organization are the ones who, uh, who decide has it changed enough to, to warrant giving a, a, new, uh, a new name to it. And the last one that's actually uh, cropped up uh, was the, the swine flu, and that was again, it was a, an H1N1, but it had pig characteristics. Um, the flu virus um, uh, also affects other animals, uh, particularly birds, birds, pigs, and horses. 
And um, in, the, in 2009, the, uh, uh, the swine, what ended up being called swine flu epidemic, um, that, was, um, that started almost certainly uh, near uh, a pig farm in, um, in Mexico. And uh, when they, by, by 2009, they could actually look at the DNA, uh, the RNA, and uh, work out exactly what, uh, what was going on. And they found that there was, it was very similar to the ordinary H1N1, but it had pig characteristics in it as well, which just made it against, it, it wasn't sufficient to change the numbers, but it was sufficient to, uh, to that you normally call it variant um, H1N1. And as you can see, whenever there was a, uh, a, new, a, a new strain, Spanish flu was the real big one, 50 to 100 million dead. Uh, Asian flu, around about 2 million. Hong Kong flu, 1 million. Swine flu, which caused a, a big fuss at the time, uh, sort of 10 years ago, <coughs> was 150,000 uh, 150, deaths worldwide. Um, I mean, I, I, I was working as a pharmacist in Boots at the time, and uh, in the retail park in Kempston, and we were one of the uh, places supplying the Tamiflu antivirus. Uh, I was one of the coordinators for it, so I got all the data uh, whenever uh, uh, I was helping to collect the data to send back to the, the local, health, local health authority to uh, see how, how the, uh, the epidemic was progressing. Now, one very unusual feature there, the 1918 flu pandemic, was the age of the people who died. Mm -hmm. Usually, the, pe the sort of people who, almost anyone would get the flu, the, the people who actually get it severely enough to actually die from it, generally are the very young, uh, usually under four or five, uh, the el very elderly, because the people's immune system isn't working so well, or people who are frail or have got some other, some other illness like tuberculosis that means that their lungs are already not working as well as they should be. And this dotted line is, what you, is the average for 1911 to 1917. As you see, it starts off quite high for uh, children under one, it drops down and it's virtually nil. Um, for, from sort of uh, early teens through to four, uh, people in their forties or in, into the fifties, and then it zooms up quite rapidly. One thing that happened with the 1918 strain is that more more young children died of it. It never went down right down to zero with uh, in the age groups, and then went back up again. So there was a big blip in the middle where people who normally would just shrug off the flu. Uh, people from their sort of teens through to their 30s and 40s were also dying of it, and that was very, very unusual. But after that, it actually never went quite as high, um, and that was almost certain. I reckon it's because people who were in their 60s, 70s, 80s had come across so many other versions of the flu earlier on in their, in their lifetime that they would have come across something that was close enough to that to be at least slightly immune to it. And the reason why they think that uh, people had this, uh, were normally very healthy and would normally be able to fight the flu off very easily <coughs> is a thing called uh, cytokine storm. And what it is, is when the, the body overreacts, the people have got a very healthy immune system um, and they suddenly react violently to, to a foreign thing getting in the body like a virus and it, the, the body's reaction actually causes more damage than the, um, than the virus itself. And uh, particularly on the lungs, uh, people um, were finding that uh, the, uh, the, the lungs were almost uh, uh, being destroyed. And of course, uh, that, that was going to be fatal in many, in many cases. So it wasn't anything to do with the fact in wartime People's well, the, to be honest, the, there was probably factors, certainly in, in Germany there may have been a factor, in that uh, uh, Germany being blockaded uh, pretty, Sorry, pretty successfully. Um, they'd had um, the winter of 1916-17 was known as turnip winter because their, their staple food of uh, potatoes, the potato crop, 
was a, was a massive failure. It didn't fail completely, um, but it, it was known as turnip winter because that was the only staple food uh, for, that, for that winter. And that was the winter, that was a year more than a year earlier. But um, obviously, four, four, four years of, intent, of, of intense war is going to always, always cause, uh, cause problems. And uh, with um, the, uh, so thing with the German, the, uh, there was an almost complete blockade of any ships of theirs. Um, they had no access to the Mediterranean or anything like that either. So uh, they, they couldn't get in a lot of the foodstuffs that they would normally have been able to. So there was a, a comparative famine. Um, the other thing was um, uh, soldiers who'd uh, suffered uh, from gas attacks from 1915 onwards. Um, obviously some, some people suffered very badly and uh, had very severe damage to, to their lungs and some died. But even uh, a small amount of gas could cause some sort of damage or scarring on the lungs. So people who managed to recover within a few days or a few weeks would still be slightly susceptible to, uh, to other, other infections that also cause damage to the lungs. With, with, um, with the fact that a lot of healthy men have been killed to the war um, to a certain extent, but um, it, it affected uh, men and women uh, uh, as well. Uh, it was it was an age-related thing uh, as much as anything as much as anything else. Um, obviously, with um, with uh, let's say the so many um, sort of people, men in the prime of their life, being. Um, uh, doing war duty and also uh, getting uh, killed or injured in the war, uh, that certainly did, probably didn't help, but it, it affected everyone, whether they were um, uh, in people who were in reserve occupations, it affected them, it affected women as well, so uh, it's probably not so much of a factor. It is, it is, it is possible that that had some, had some, uh, some influence on it. <coughs> So I've got uh, three pictures. This is from a medical book of, of the time. Um, this was um, a standard uh, flu victim. Uh, high temperature, flush face. Uh, it says uh, it, the patient might not appear ill if not for the drooping of the upper eyelids given a half-closed appearance to the eyes and the facial colour is faintly red. That was a bog standard <coughs> flu patient. One of the things that doctors and nurses feared was uh, there was a particular thing that happened with people whose, whose lungs were extremely badly damaged by the flu virus. And that was, they, they took on a very peculiar mauve lilac uh, uh, coloration. And it actually had a, it actually had a name called heliotrope cyanosis and it was a uh, it was a, a very peculiar color and it basically to be honest, it basically reflects the fact that uh, oxygen wasn't getting to the blood um, blood that's got enough oxygen in it is bright red blood that hasn't got any oxygen in it is bluish uh, so what this really meant was the blood that was circulating around in the skin and everything like that was actually of a bluish appearance simply because not enough oxygen was getting into the lungs and into the blood. It says here the patient is not in physical distress, but the prognosis is almost hopeless. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> but it was certainly, um, it, you know, in, in for instance, a field hospital or a temporary, uh, temporary um, hospital ward, which often had to be uh, set up because the amount of victims of the flu in, 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 uh, in a short period of time. If they saw anyone who had turned a, a lilac colour, they was, they was pretty sure that, that, was, uh, that they didn't have much chance. And then there's this one, which is a, a, a ver another variation. The colour of the lips and ears, uh, a purpley colour, and uh, the face was, uh, face was uh, uh, very pale. And again, it says at the bottom, the patient may yet live for 12 hours or more. <laughs> so again, not, not good news. <coughs> so where did, where did this new virus appear from? Um, there's been, over the years, there have been three main theories. Um, one was that it originated in Europe. Uh, 
there, there had been an outbreak of a similar type of thing in barracks and uh, temporary uh, camps near Aldershot in 1917, and Etarpe uh, in France. Um, the, uh, on the French coast between Boulogne and Dieppe was almost a, a solid um, transit camp. There was uh, troops going in, troops going home, uh, there was massive field hospitals, and they had all the things that they needed, like pig farms and chicken farms, in order to, um, um, to deal uh, to, for food and stuff for everyone who was there. They were normally, they were reckoned that there was, in this um, sort of stretch of the French coastline, there was never less than about 100,000 people along the coast. Uh, and again, there was an outbreak uh, the previous year, in 1917, of a, um, of a disease which had similar sort of, uh, similar sort of outcomes, and, but it was much more uh, limited to just a, uh, certainly there was no major death toll from it. The other place where they thought that there's a possibility it came from, and it's where certainly the Asian flu and the Hong Kong flu came from, was um, China. Uh, it was not widely known, but a large number of Chinese um, actually were, were sent over to Europe to work behind the lines, doing all the manual work. Uh, the getting more yeah, yes, 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 <laughs> they are. Yes, yeah, the, the, the science actually starting to get uh, some. Uh, uh, some you know, recognition for it. Uh, um, they were actually sent um, normally by on by boat to the, the um, west coast of America, and then on sealed trains across America, and then went on troop ships um, um, over 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 to Europe. Um, they were basically employed so that they so that the the actual fight the troops could actually do the fighting and weren't weren't needed to fill sandbags and all that sort of stuff build railway line, temporary railway lines, and the like. Um, again, there, 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 is, there are things for and against it being, being that. Um, the, um, the, again, there was definitely an outbreak of the year before, in 1917, and also some, at some regions of uh, China were, weren't that badly affected by the 1918 outbreak which suggests that possibly they're already at least partly immune to that particular strain of virus, uh, which could explain, uh, could be that they've already been circulating in China the previous year. But probably the one that's got the most uh, decent evidence is Kansas. Um, they had been, um, certain training camps. Um, the United States had joined the, had joined the war in the, in the big uh, spring of 1917, and it was just starting to get masses of uh, troops ready to, uh, to, be, to be shipped over to Europe. And there was uh, lots of very large camps holding up to sort of 10, 20, 30,000 uh, people, uh, troops in training. <coughs> scattered all over the, uh, the Midwest of, uh, of America. And all of these people came from farming communities. Uh, uh, they often said sort of strapping young lads who, uh, who could fire a gun because they'd done a bit of hunting, but they didn't have any uh, um, army experience. So they were basically licked into shape in, in training camps, sent to the ports on the east coast of America, and then over, then over to, uh, then over to Europe. And what is definitely known, there's even a name, the first person who definitely got the Spanish flu. I haven't got a photograph of him, but his name was Albert Gitchin. Um, 4th of March 1918, a guy called Albert Gitchell, who was a cook in uh, Camp Funston in Kansas, fell sick. Uh, within days, there was hundreds uh, in the... Uh, uh, had fallen sick and the infirmary uh, was at, uh, had to be expanded enormously. In fact, they had to open up huge hangar type um, places. And this is actually in Camp Fun uh, Funston. Um, uh, a lot of people went down with the flu, but there weren't too many deaths. There was, there's, 
Thousands and thousands went down with the flu in, in these camps, but the deaths were only measured in dozens. I'm just going to do a couple more slides and then we're going to have a, a break and we'll do the, um, uh, do the raffle and if, so if anyone wants uh, refreshments. What's the, what, why is it called Spanish? Yeah. Oh, I'm coming to that. That's going to be the, probably the last slide before, before the, the half time. Also, oh, oh, over, in, over in Europe, over in Europe, um, Germans were getting a bit worried. Um, the uh, Americans were pouring in, but they did have plenty of spare troops, often battle hardened from the Eastern Front. Because, the, uh, because of, the, of the Russian Revolution and the fall of the Tsar, and there was various peace treaties um, and fighting on the, west, on the Eastern Front, on the Russian side, had basically uh, uh, fallen away to virtually nothing. They needed to keep some troops out there, but all of a sudden they had plenty of, um, uh, of troops that were uh, being experienced in, in battle available to have one final push. And they, uh, on the 21st of March, spring they started the spring offensive in this area here. Over the next month or so, they were worried, getting worryingly close to Paris, which is the, one of their main objectives. And what they were hoping was that they would do, even if they didn't win the war, they would have a, a big enough effect that they could sue for peace uh, on reasonable terms. The trouble was, by then, flu was there. It was this novel type of flu, it's this H1N1, but it wasn't, wasn't particularly deadly at that point. It was, um, made, but it was putting people out of action for, for weeks. Um, the, um, the Germans called it Blitz Qatar, which is <laughs> lightning cold. Uh, in, by the end of April, uh, both sides were, were badly affected. Um, the uh, earliest three quarters of the French troops at some point uh, uh, caught, caught the flu. Uh, around about half the British uh, troops also caught the flu. On the German side, nearly a million uh, were out of action at some point or other. Uh, so field hospitals on both sides are struggling to cope. Uh, and they say, although the death toll was no higher than the, norm, the, the normal flu, but it may, meant that people really couldn't fight. And the, uh, this offensive basically started to peter out. And also, of course, by this time, more and more, uh, more, and more American troops are flooding in. And there's a little thing here, it's not very easy to read. Um, the uh, Press Association, in uh, 24th of May 1918, reports that there was mutinies uh, in, the, uh, in the German ranks. And also, it says from medical sources, it's also been ascertained a very severe epidemic of influenza is now raging in the ranks of German forces. What they didn't say, of course, was that it was happening on the Allied side as well. <laughs> and this is where the Spanish bit comes from. Um, under wartime censorship, the Germans didn't want the British to know that they were struggling. The French, uh, Americans and England the British didn't want the Germans to know, so it was all, it was all kept hush-hush as much as possible. Spain was neutral, so they, had, they didn't have any problems in uh, reporting uh, illness. Um, so it looked like, when, the, when reports first started ha coming in the papers uh, towards the end of May, all the reports were that a strain of a flu had broken out in, in Spain. Uh, King Alfonso XIII here, he, he went down and it was touch and go with him. His, um, his pro the Prime Minister and uh, uh, members of the cabinet and high up in the uh, Spanish government also went down. A lot of speculation was completely wrong. Um, in the people on the 26th of May, he said, an unprecedented epidemic of influenza, more than 30% of the population uh, becoming victims. 
but the doctors attribute it to the great earthworks thrown up by the construction of the Metropolitan Railway. So basically they were digging an underground system from the dreams and there was obviously piles of earth everywhere. Oh, that's called, that's caused the flu, but of course it's totally rubbish. But, uh, it was something that it was reported in the papers at the time. And then there in the Daily Mail, um, it says King Alfonso, the Premier, and other, the Premier and other ministers, and 30% of the population of Spain are suffering from an unknown epidemic, symptoms of which are high fever, pains in the chest, and diarrhoea. And the disease is of a mild nature. <laughs> which it was, to a certain extent, compared with what happened later. Um, Look, there's already some things here. Now, this 30% here is actually 30% of the population of Madrid. Now, three days later, the Daily Mail is saying 30% of the population of Spain. And after, in researching this, some of the things that are put on some internet sites are, are absolutely dreadful. Uh, uh, there's people who have obviously done have been very uh, lacking in their research or very, very lazy in copying uh, a lot of things you see exactly the same story. Um, one of the things that quite often crops up is saying that uh, there was 8 million Spaniards killed in the... Now, the 8 million is possibly the amount of... It came back to a story at the time saying that there was 8 million victims, but it actually meant 8 million people caught the flu. Mm -hmm. Uh, the actual figure for, for Spain was somewhere in about 200,000 over, 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 the, over, the, over the period from 1918 through to the end of 1919. But uh, uh, 8 million, I thought, well, that's, that's not right, that's 40% that's of the entire population. But uh, it was uh, someone, someone had read, read it, misread what it meant, and then every, loads of other websites had copied it. In fact, if you see here, this is this is a thing from uh, from 1920. Uh, Madrid was was the only place uh, in the first phase of the of the, of the flu in June, uh, May and June, had reasonably large numbers of people dying, 56 and 220. <coughs> All the others were only about 16 to 20. But in the when it came back later on in the year, Madrid was one of the smaller numbers of. Uh, uh, people dying, less than 200 in October, where there was over a thousand in Barcelona. So at that point, that explains where the Spanish bit came from, because it's, the Spanish bit is stuck with it, and it's always been known as the Spanish blue stings. Obviously, it did ravage Spain, but it's got nothing to do with Spain. All, about, of all the places it could have originated from, Spain it definitely wasn't. So we're going to have a quick break, about 10 minutes or so. Is it good job we've got the food jab in here? Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the components of this year's flu jab is an H1N1. So. <laughs> First half ended in sunny Spain. Second half is going to start in sunny Bedford. Uh, well, actually not Bedford, Hitchin and... Out till actually, but uh, getting closer. Okay, so the flu had already been raging in the trenches and in sort of, uh, on the Western Front. Uh, first cases of flu in the UK appeared in uh, May 1918 in the Glasgow area. Uh, it's almost certainly probably brought over by troop ships from Canada because after the um, sinking of the Lusitania, most of the troop ships and ocean liners that have been converted into troop ships took a, took a more northerly route, uh, usually leaving from Halifax in Nova Scotia, Canada, and taking a northern route around the top end of Ireland, either to the Clyde and disembarking in Glasgow, or often going down to Liverpool that way. Um, and it's probably Canadian uh, troops or someone from Canada probably brought it over to, uh, to the Glasgow area. 
um, newspaper reporting restrictions in this country meant that virtually nothing was said about what was, what was going on. Um, but by the end of June, most of the country was affected, and although it was mainly mild, um, there were the occasional reports of uh, factories being in trouble, um, coal mines, and various sorts of uh, industries which uh, were quite vital to the, uh, to the both to the war effort and to the uh, country itself. Um, but again, very little was actually said. Um, in the uh, papers, the local papers, we've got uh, adverts from the Taylor Broad and Floods in Bedford. Uh, for Trey's description, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a thing called Pinsaline, which is apparently just an antiseptic, um, but uh, it's supposed to cure and prevent colds and influenza. Uh, one thing that often we found, that even if there wasn't any, um, any reports in the papers, because uh, uh, things like um, sort of medicines <coughs> used to treat uh, colds and flu, what you got uh, was an increase in the amount of adverts for those because they, were, they, they knew that those people uh, coming, uh, wanting those type of things. So to promote a particular chemist or a particular shop that sold things like face masks and things like that, um, they were um, they were promoting them in the uh, they in as adverts in the papers. Um, the Biggleswade Chronicle got in on the act. Um, there was only I could only find one thing in the Biggleswade Chronicle in that first phase of the of the flu, and that was there was people concerned because three men were found collapsed in the road. And actually, the little headline is saying, not the Spanish <laughs> flu. In fact, so there's three men from Halo who were found drunk and incapable. <laughs> uh, there was sort of, one was uh, lying in a, in, a, in a doctor's gateway, and there was one on the floor and one on the pavement. Uh, but the little headline was, not the Spanish flu. Um, again, with the Canadians, uh, the, um, there was a big camp in um, in, Ant in Antill Park, and there was a lot of Canadians and a lot of lumber. There, there, were, there was a lot of lumberjacks there who uh, were uh, uh, chopping down trees for the for the I think, materials needed in the war effort. And again, Bed's Times in in, in the July they reported in the Antill section saying that a severe epidemic of Spanish influenza is prevalent in the district. Uh, two concerts at the Canadian YMCA hut have been put off. Again, it wasn't sort of, it, it was, a lot of people were falling down, falling ill with it, but it wasn't causing too many, too many major problems. But by the middle of July, although there was fewer cases being reported, there was a very worrying trend because there was fewer cases being reported, but more deaths and more people getting into severe aversion. And it's almost certain that Something again, something a, a subtle change was happening in the virus, and it was mutating to a more virulent strain that was actually causing more damage to the to the lungs. But by the end of July, it was pretty well gone across the whole country. Uh, cases were down to just uh, just sporadic cases around around the place, and for the next couple of months, it, certainly in, in Britain, in England, there was very few cases of the, of the flu. And here we have, this is, a, this is a graph for the entire country. Uh, the end of, um, end of June here, 29th, weekend of 29th of June, we get a peak for, from there until the 27th of July. But the, the, the cases of flu were actually started in, in May, so off the end of the thing. So it's coming right down to the tail end. There was a big jump in the number, this is the number of deaths a big jump in the number of deaths to, right towards the end and then it went down to virtually nothing and all of a sudden uh, towards the end of september first week in october a massive rise and for two months uh, the death toll across the country was anywhere between five and twenty times higher than normal and then it died down again now in normal seasonal flu Seasonal flu normally starts uh, in a typical year, um, a week or two before Christmas, 
reaches its peak in January, February, and then it's uh, it's gone by gone by Easter. It's normally gone by the end of March, beginning of April. So usually you'd see a spike in cases in this area here, which is January and February, but there wasn't. But then it rose again in February and March, but nowhere near as bad in the, set, in the, in the third wave. This is one of the, the biggest of the troop ships, the SS Leviathan. Um, it, was off, it was a bit notorious as being a, a plague ship. Uh, it was originally uh, a German ship. It had only been launched in 1913 and only made a couple of uh, crossings between Hamburg and uh, New York. Uh, it, arrived in, it arrived in New York uh, at the end of uh, July 1914. It obviously got wind of the fact that war was about to take place and it, it, it failed to leave. And once um, uh, war had been declared, it, it, uh, it wouldn't leave the port uh, for fear of either being uh, captured or sunk by the, Brit by the Royal Navy. So it stopped in the, on the Hudson River, opposite Manhattan, for three years uh, until the Americans uh, joined the war and they requisitioned it. Uh, partly in uh, response to the fact that uh, American ships were being sunk by U-boats and uh, partly the, because it they needed um, large uh, ocean-going liners to transport the troops. Uh, and it actually carried up to 14,000 people on the ship at any one time. So if, if that, that type of uh, uh, number, if uh, they'd been sunk, there would be the Titanic had a thousand odd deaths. If, they, if this had been sunk mid-Atlantic, uh, who, know, who knows, there's almost certainly not enough lifeboats for 14,000. Uh, this is a painting uh, of it uh, in its dazzled colours uh, being escorted by uh, an American destroyer. And this is a photograph of it, again, in its dazzled colours. One particularly notorious voyage was on the 29th of September, about the time when, it start, when the flu cases started to rise abruptly. Uh, it set sail for Brest in, uh, in, in Brittany, uh, had 9,000 troops and 2,000 crew on board. Um, on the third day, by the third day, 700 were, were ill and the first death had occurred. By the time it docked in Brest on the 8th of October, two, I found there were 2,000 Soldiers mainly, but for some reason the, actual, the the crew had very very low death rates. Uh, it was the same crew every time, and they had had um, cases of the flu earlier on. So whether they had actually built up a bit of an immunity mm -hmm. to it, um, but by the time it docked in Brest in October, October the eighth, um, over two thousand had fallen ill, and, been, and eight, there had been eighty deaths, which were buried at sea. And still it didn't stop. Uh, there was 280 that were too ill to disembark, and 14 died on the day that they day that it uh, landed in, in France. And over a thousand had to be evacuated to field hospitals on stretches. They actually said that there was a uh, it was a four mile long procession of um, ambulances and stretcher bearers uh, taking the uh, taking the, the men off the uh, off the boat. And it wasn't just one way. Um, a couple of weeks earlier, uh, the um, Theodore Roosevelt's son, uh, who had been sent over to um, uh, to France, had returned and caught and caught the flu on the boat on the boat itself, and he had to be stretched <coughs> off when he got back. And that was uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was uh, the uh, president of the United States during the Second World War. Yeah. Most of the Second World War. Another interesting thing about the SS Leviathan was the, the, the main quartermaster on the on the uh, on the boat um, was um, Humphrey Bogart before before he got into his film career. <laughs> Just a, a useless little fact. <laughs> <laughs> but now we come to Bedford and come to Queen Spark. I'm getting closer to home. <laughs> so, Bed's Times, 25th of October. 
is a report of a council meeting, and uh, there was a report, uh, part of the council meeting was a medical report on the state of the health in, in Bedford. And they actually said from the 18th to the 28th of September, there was not a single death was registered of a Bedford resident. There were, I'll come to the, a bit, uh, the deaths column in a minute, um, there were some deaths in, in, the, in the Bedford area, but there was not a single one, from, the only one that actually came from Bedford. But, let's say, this is on the 25th of a, a, a report of a, a meeting on the 23rd. It said, since then, there's been a number of deaths from ordinary causes, and in the last two days, seven deaths from influenza, all except two in the Queen's Park district. Uh, and, they were saying schools were, there was people off ill from schools in large numbers. Um, there was thought of having to close the schools, and they also said that managers of Sunday schools should be requested to close theirs also. Uh, managers of the kinemas, <laughs> the old, the old fashioned, but the kinematograph. Uh, picture. Yeah, picture houses. Oh, not, what, not one of the recognised picture. No, 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 that was a generalised term. It's an old fashioned term. No, for the picture, a, for a, for a the picture drone was the first yeah. map, wasn't here. No. But uh, they, they, all, they said they, uh, they would ask the managers uh, if they would assist the council by not admitting school children under a certain age <laughs> during the time that the schools were closed. <laughs> And it was basically to try and make sure that there was not large yeah. gatherings of people where, yeah. the, where the flu could, uh, could spread. Now, this is a photograph of the death column of the Bed Times on the 4th of October. There was only six deaths recorded and none of them were from Bedford. I think it was two from Kempston, one from Cardington, one from Willington and two others from out, out, out of town. So there's only six. A month later, or four weeks later, this is on the same scale, there was 54 deaths in the death column. Now, obviously not all of those are from flu, but you can bet the life most of them were. Some of them do actually say from flu or influenza or pneumonia, uh, but uh, the, the difference in four weeks is uh, really quite dramatic. And what often happened was, uh, through um, <coughs> in streets like in Queen's Park and in the town centre where the bus station is now, uh, the streets are relatively crowded together, uh, you, used, you would find that the, um, the flu would ravage a whole section of, uh, of that community. And uh, Grattan Road, just up the road from here, uh, was a good example of how deadly it could be. Um, looking back in the, uh, in, the rec in, the, in the deaths column in the paper, uh, there have been no deaths uh, for, for months in Grattan Road. But then 21st of October, three, there was three people died on the same day at number 51, 6 and 9. Two young children and, uh, and, and a woman in her 30s. Again, not typical of the, of the age of the people who die of flu or of any... Of any uh, cause the 30 year old and eight days later two more deaths again 25 year old and a, and a 35 year old tragically the 10, 25 year old man was the father of the, uh, the six month old who died a week earlier <laughs> but after that looking through the death column for the next few months until the end of the uh, till, through till December there was no more from, from Grattan Road. It was a short, sharp shock. Uh, a whole load of people all went down. You can see from the addresses, uh, two at number six, one at number seven, one at number nine, and one at the other end of the street. But there was, there was a cluster. And th this happened all over Bedford. Uh, I've, I've used um, Grattan Road as an example. Gwynn Street, uh, there was about eight deaths in Gwynn Street in about two weeks. All uh, with the number, the natural numbers, all within about uh, 10 or 20 of each other. And Pilcroft Street, which is south of the river, near where Kingsway is, uh, again there was a, a, a big cluster for about a week or so, where about five or six, there were five or six deaths, all all clustered together. And I did this little graph. Now the grey is. 
the average number of deaths, there were uh, obituaries in the deaths column in events times for that time of the year, which is about 14. Um, in, in the normal, uh, later on in the winter, it's normal, it was about 18, when flu would have been expected. The blue columns are the numbers of obituaries for those particular weeks, starting the, uh, the 20th of the 10th. The biggest week was uh, the uh, weekend in the 3rd of, 3rd of November, but if all four weeks in November, you're talking 40 to 50 uh, deaths per week. Whereas the average uh, reported was uh, often in single figures, and certainly uh, only just into double figures. And thank you to, for Colin, who uh, collated some figures for me um, for the uh, burials at Bedford Cemetery. Again, you'll see that normally it was around about seven or eight a week, roughly one a day. But um, it uh, started off here. Um, just over 10, and it reached a peak of nearly 40 in uh, the third week, third week in November. There's a little bit, a bit of an anomaly here, but that's at least partly explained by the fact that there were seven prisoners of war from uh, prisoner of war camp at South Hill were, uh, were buried that week. So that takes up a, a bit of a number of those. And of course, it's almost certainly that the, uh, the cemetery was overwhelmed and uh, people weren't buried quite as quickly as they would like to have been. It was certainly a thing that happened uh, worldwide, that um, there was uh, in, not, uh, not enough grave diggers and not enough people to actually do any ceremonies to be able to bury every, uh, that, that amount of people. And as you can see, by the time you get to here, which is the uh, 6th of, uh, of December, it's starting to decline. And a couple of weeks after that, it's actually right down to virtually, uh, virtually down to the, to the norm for that time of year. Uh, Queen's Park School registers, are, uh, or the, the books that, uh, that the school, uh, the headmaster had to do, uh, on a week, normally on a weekly or daily basis, that were often quite illuminating. This is Queen's Park Infant School. Uh, their report from the 28th of um, October through to the 18th of November. And here, this week here, the, the previous week was fairly normal. Uh, and it just, it, there was over 80% uh, attendance at the school. By this week, it says very poor attendance due to so much illness amongst the children. And only about 40%, 4 out of 10 of those children, uh, were actually at school that week. It actually went up a little bit when, on the next report, but the school was closed and children were sent home until the 11th of, uh, 11th of November. But because things hadn't actually improved by then, uh, on the advice of the school medical officer, they were closed for a further period. They didn't reopen until the 18th. Queen's Park Junior School, there's a little bit more information on there. Various things here, this is the 14th of October, uh, Miss Hazeldean away from school today owing to influenza. Large number of children absent for the same reason. Miss, the 15th, Miss Cook, who was very unwell yesterday and ought to not to have remained at school, absent today from influenza. 16th. Miss Hazeldean returned, but not at all well. Miss Cook still away. And on the 16th, uh, they had communication from the, from the office instructing me to close the school for a week, that's till the 23rd of, um, 23rd of October, owing to the prevalence of influenza. So school assembled and was dismissed accordingly. It reopened but it said number in attendance not much lower than last week. But very much lower than, than last week. But of course, there, was, there wasn't anyone at school the previous week, but they're talking about the week, the last week that children were at school. Uh, and here, the, on the school roll, there's about, there about 600 on the school roll at the time. Number present today, 326. Miss Fitch still away suffering from influenza. Uh, Miss Newton away from the, this mm -hmm. afternoon, Miss Armstrong away with influenza, Mr Carnival also away with influenza, making the third teacher absent from the same cause. 
And they had a meeting uh, that evening and they decided to close the school again. So kids turned up on the next day, on the 30th, and they were told they were dismissed. And on the 7th, they said they were going to do it, uh, extend it. The 18th, schools reopened, all teachers present, number of children, 527. So there was, so there was about 590 on the school roll. So it was pretty, pretty <coughs> well. Cool. But there were still complaints. Um, two days later, attendance not so good, many children are away without any reasonable cause. <laughs> <laughs> and even going on into the 10th of December, attendance so far this week is not as good as last week. There appears to be considerable illness amongst parents and older persons, not amongst the children. But children, girls especially, are kept home. In some cases, this absence is excusable but in others, the prevalence of illness in the locality is mere subterfuge for using the child in Eden. So basically, they were keeping the kids off school to do errands around the house and probably do little jobs and all sorts of things. At this time, although it was a junior school, they, they, there wasn't a senior school in Queen's Park, so they stopped on a school, doing the school till 13. So uh, there was... Uh, some of the some were quite old, quite old, so they were the sort of people that were probably doing odd little jobs around the place. And George Henry, he was uh, he joined W. H. Allen's uh, when they first opened in London in 1880, and became company secretary. And he was often called uh, W. H. Allen's right hand man. He'd only been off work once in nearly 40 years when he caught the flu in July 1918, and he caught the tail end of the flu, so almost certainly got one of the, 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 the worst versions of it. And he never really recovered. Um, he attempted to go back to work a couple of times, but uh, kept having to go off to convalesce, and he died on, on, in April the next year from uh, uh, complications relating to the, to the flu. And, when they knocked down Allen's and they built uh, a housing estate there, one of the roads was actually named after him, Henry Road. Great, yes. Yeah. You agree with that? Moving away a little bit from Bedford, but heading towards uh, sort of Bedfordshire, uh, this was a, a report in January in the Biggles Wake Chronicle. Uh, it was a medical report for Biggleswade Rural District. So it wasn't Biggleswade itself, but it was all the towns and villages around it. And uh, again, this, this is fairly typical. First death mm -hmm. in the area was in Meppershaw in, on October the 7th. And between that date and the end of December, 100 deaths were registered. Um, and it actually gives the number per week. Uh, so it goes 242588. And then 23, 22, 14, the last three, last three weeks in November were by far the biggest uh, uh, number. And these are quite small villages, and these are the sort of big places where there might only be one or two deaths a year in, the, in, in a village with a population of just a few hundred. Uh, of, the 40, of the 100 deaths, uh, 42 of them were for persons not... Uh, per, persons usually resident in other districts. And you can see there's a Henlow, there was five, non-resident two, so they were almost certainly from camps in Henlow. I don't know when Henlow, the they RAF station is slightly later than that, but there, there were army camps in Henlow. Um, Potton, there was one non-resident. Uh, Sandy, there were seven non non residents. Mm -hmm. Shefford, uh, six, two non residents. Southill, one. Prisoner of War Camp, non resident, 11. Um, the Prisoner of War Camp in Southill was actually near where Southill Station was. Um, uh, in one of the fields quite close to Southill Station. There's no record of exactly where it, where it was. Uh, the, uh, the only things I can find about it in the paper was in 1920 when the Ministry of Defence or Ministry of War was selling, selling off uh, the huts 
There was a, an auction in uh, Biggleswade uh, to sell, sell off the huts in um, that were in South of uh, Prisoner of War camp. And the other really big one was down here, the Three Counties Asylum, 25 deaths of which 23 were non were non resident So this is the uh, the, uh, the asylum at Arlesy. <coughs> and again, we've got the thing here saying what age range they were. The younger ages, uh, one to five is only one male, uh, five to 15, two. But you've come into some areas where there's um, uh, 25 to 35, 12 males and, and uh, 25 females. Again, you were saying, the gentleman was saying about uh, the fact of men were, at that age were away fighting. That, that was one of the things that to, uh, uh, explain why there were so many females in that age group that, uh, that died and only, only twice, twice as many as, uh, as the males. And this is a couple of things from the um, Bedford High School magazine, uh, Aquila. Um, they quite often used to have letters from old girls who had gone away to university or uh, away doing other things. And uh, this is usually anonymously. They never seem to put any names up to these letters. They only say, your correspondent at St Hilda's or, <laughs> or, or whatever. This one is from uh, Lady Margaret Hall uh, in the November edition, saying it's a rather dismal time. Uh, as the hall is more like a hospital than a college. There have been over 60 cases of influenza since the first week of term. And Hope Lacey has been amongst the victims. I assume that they, that someone, that's, they actually died. And uh, all activities and games have, uh, have basically stopped. One thing, this is further on in the same letter, something that is scarcely believable these days, is that from the middle of um, uh, 1918, there was quite a, a bit of a campaign to uh, get people to smoke in order to uh, fume, have a fumigating effect, also to strengthen their chest <laughs> and to help cough up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the disease from, from, from their lungs. So, uh, the, the actually, in this, in this same letter, they said there was general satisfaction felt on the announcement of the alteration of the smoking rule. Formerly, smoking was strictly forbidden in college, and now it's been conceded that students may smoke in their own rooms after dinner in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, the next edition, which is in April, and uh, there was four deaths in it, and they're all um, deaths from uh, influenza or pneumonia. Some of them are obviously old girls, and some of them, some are probably still at the school. And this is a little graph showing the death rate for various English cities. Uh, the first wave, it's all fairly much the same. But there's a few distinctions in the second wave. Portsmouth, you know, being a, a port, it came a bit earlier, and so did Liverpool, which is this little peak here. London was a little bit intermediate, but it was noted that in London, uh, the first uh, increase in cases were normally in, in dock areas, uh, and particularly dock areas that also had military <coughs> establishments. Uh, Woolwich was particularly badly affected very early on, and the other places, uh, the other areas of London that were affected badly early on were ones with main, uh, main termini, so uh, uh, St Pancras, area was, uh, was very badly affected early on. Was, uh, was that area obviously included King's Cross as well. Excuse me, where were the, where were the um, troops demobilised from the abroad? Where did they come back to the country? Oh, that, that, were, that, that sometimes took uh, as, as late as the middle of uh, 1919. Because peace, uh, although the armistice was signed for the, the 11th mm -hmm. of November, until after the peace conference in Paris in February and March, 1919, uh, the, the peace wasn't actually formally signed, so the uh, majority of uh, troops didn't come back. Some, some went, some left before then, but uh, a lot of the troops didn't come back until uh, till the uh, spring of uh, 1919. Could the two peaks possibly just wait for the troops coming back? Um, 
Probably not. There's a possible. The, the, I get the second peak, the, the first peak, the, the middle peak, the worst one, definitely wasn't because uh, the war was still going on then. Um, the, uh, the, the, the main peaks were actually at the beginning of November, although it, it carried on through the, the rest of November. Uh, most soldiers didn't uh, didn't uh, weren't sent home within weeks of uh, of, of uh, the armistice. Uh, they, uh, they they usually took a lot longer to get back. Uh, one other thing that's noticeable is that uh, uh, in the third wave uh, it tended to be more intense in the north and the midlands, and that's possibly because. Um, the south, the south and the Midlands were more affected in the first wave. And again, it meant that people were already had some immunity, and there's more people that had some sort of immunity to it by the time the third wave uh, appeared. And of these, of these, ta of these cities here, the one most uh, affected is Bradford, and Manchester was the second most affected in the, in the, uh, in the third wave. And this is uh, a map that I, I nicked from a book. Uh, of uh, the global spread. The black areas were the very first one. This is the second wave. Uh, black areas, uh, West Africa, uh, Spain and Portugal, and the west uh, of the Atlantic coast of uh, France were affected, first affected in August. It then spread to most of the rest of Europe in September, and also um, in, into America, and down the, uh, the coast of the Caribbean. Uh, the coastal areas of Brazil. Uh, October, November, it affected India, China, Japan, South Africa, and, and went more into the interior of uh, North and South America. And the death toll, about quarter of a million in the UK, roughly the same in Spain, 400,000 in France. 675,000 in America. There was actually three, uh, three times as many people died of the uh, Spanish flu in America than actually died fighting in the war. Most uh, the European countries, there were, more, there were more deaths actually through fighting. Like for instance, the, the British death toll was somewhere in the, about three quarters of a million-ish, sort of seven, eight hundred thousand. Um, India, astonishingly, at 17 million. In fact, that's actually been revised up a bit to about 18 and a half million. Um, and they, the, the, the figures for India are actually quite precise because one of the things that the British Empire was responsible for was pen pushing. Mm. Um, even the quite smallest, uh, uh, remotest mm. regions often had some, usually someone local as a clerk who was uh, responsible for uh, collating uh, data on all sorts of things. And the data on, uh, you'd be quite surprised at how remote some areas are, they've actually got quite precise uh, death rate figures for, for in the Indian subcontinent. Um, Indonesia was also badly affected, 170, uh, uh, one, one and a half million. Germany, 460,000. Russia, 450,000. China's a bit weird that it's one of these places where uh, there, was, there was plenty of uh, data from some areas and virtually none from others, but more has been, uh, been revealed in the last 10, 20 years. So they were talking then between 1 million and 9 million, but apparently they're saying it could be up to 10 million Chinese. But some areas didn't get it at all. Um, very few. St. Helena in the Mid Atlantic, uh, there's no cases and no deaths. And American Samoa. Now, American Samoa is, uh, was really quite unique because American Samoa isn't just one country or one island, it's a group of islands. Um, Western Samoa, next door to it, had one of the highest death rates. Uh, with nearly 20% of the population dying, uh, 8,500 dying on Western Samoa. And that was because they let in boats from, uh, from New Zealand uh, that obviously carried people who had the, uh, who were still carrying the infection. American Samoa had a strict quarantine for about uh, 18 months and they didn't have any cases or any deaths. Uh, quite a few things on the internet saying that Australia also escaped. 
and that again is someone not doing their, their research properly. It did escape the first and second wave, but it got the third wave uh, when uh, that was when the troops were uh, starting to get back from Europe and from the Middle East. And it was, about, it was relatively uh, uh, well off. Uh, well, they didn't do as badly as some areas, uh, but there's still about 12,000 deaths in 1919. There weren't any, any deaths before that. Uh, most remedies were totally useless. Um, uh, they, uh, most of them had virtually nothing in that's going to do it any good whatsoever. Um, some of them, uh, certainly high doses of uh, high doses of aspirin may have even complicated the situation by causing more bleeding. Uh, the, uh, and another thing about aspirin, aspirin was discovered by Bayer, a German company, so they were uh, are the Germans poisoning our aspirin? <laughs> uh, well, many people were badly weakened and took the time to time to recover. And uh, Bofril uh, supplies there was a big run on Bofril, uh, which uh, meant that uh, uh, people couldn't get their Bofril uh, uh, after after about uh, several, several months. <coughs> there was lots of adverts saying, "Sorry, there's a supply problem with our Bofril. We can't keep up." <laughs> Yes, yes, it's one of the one of the main yes. And so the, this is the very last section, uh, and it's all about what happened to various people. I'm actually going to go through it fairly quickly. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, famous for Sherlock Holmes and Professor Challenger, Lost World books. Um, he was already into the paranormal and. Uh, uh, clairvoyancy and um, spiritualism, um, but um, uh, he lost one of his sons to the flu in October 1918 and his brother in February 1919. He wrote, he was still a prolific author until he died in the early 30s, but he only wrote one more novel. Virtually did he have any connection with the famous, with the famous um, detectives? Uh, he was the one who wrote it. He was the one who wrote it, yes. Um, um, but he, he wrote large numbers of books on the paranormal and spiritualism, but only one more novel, one uh, Professor Challenger novel. He did write some short stories for magazines, Sherlock Holmes stories for magazines, but nothing else. Artist, Egon Schiele, uh, died of flu in Vienna, the 31st of October 1918, aged 28 three days after his pregnant wife, so the entire family died. Um, him, his wife, and uh, the unborn baby. And this is one of his last two uh, drawings that he did, and this is his wife on, the death, on, her, on her deathbed. It's actually dated the 28th of October, 1918. Edvard Munch, they painted a series of, uh, he, he had a severe case of the, of the flu, and he painted a whole series of uh, self-portraits as, as he recovered, almost all of them in the same chair, but there's lots of ones in slightly different uh, versions and different colours. Um, he survived, but his, his, his youngest sister, age 15, died. And other art that to do with the arts, uh, Sir Hubert Parry, who was famous for writing the music to mm -hmm. Jerusalem, uh, William Blake, um, Poem. Uh, Harold Lockwood, uh, silent film star, they both died, but some famous survivors, uh, Greta Garbo and Raymond Chandler. Move on to politicians. David Lloyd George, uh, who was Prime Minister for the, the last half of the war, um, he actually went up to Manchester to receive the um, honour of uh, freedom of the city. Uh, typical Manchester weather, heavy drizzle, made a speech on the, on the town hall steps, went to a banquet, fell ill, and was very seriously ill. Um, they had to suppress, the, it was in a time when the, um, the war was in a vital stage, they didn't want the uh, uh, news to get out that the Prime Minister was on death's door, and uh, they just blamed it, getting a chill from the, uh, from the Manchester weather. Um, he spent nine days, he, he didn't actually, they set up a, a, a hospital room in uh, Manchester Town Hall for him 
and they actually put him on a primitive type of respirator that uh, wasn't available to the normal public. But he, he, he survived. Someone a bit less uh, well known, but uh, very significant, even up to today, mm. so Mark Sykes, mm -hmm. who was uh, with uh, Mr. Pico, uh, set up the arrangement to carve up the Middle East. Uh, <laughs> and they made a bit of a bodge of it, really. They, uh, they cut lots of corners, uh, mainly by just drawing straight lines across <laughs> from, one, from one point to another, and didn't really take into account uh, tribal uh, uh, tribal areas or areas of different religion, and possibly a lot of the uh, a lot of the problems in the Middle East still stem from that because uh, the borders. If you look at the maps of the Middle East and things like Syria, just a straight line that goes straight through, and it, it didn't really take any account of uh, thing, uh, thing possible uh, future problems. Woodrow Wilson, the American president. He was taken ill with, uh, Mark Sykes died during the, while well, attending the peace conference in Paris in 1919. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, he was taken ill with flu and so was uh, his principal advisor. He was very keen on not punishing Germany too badly because you could foresee that there was going to be problems. If they punished them too badly, then there was, there was storing up problems for the future. Um, with him being taken ill, he missed out, missed out a lot of the meetings. He was ill for some of the others. He was very subdued. And the uh, British and the French, who wanted the Germany to be pub uh, punished more severely, got the, basically got their way. Um, obviously, that caused loads of problems in Germany in the 1920s and early 30s, and uh, gave way to nationalism in, in Germany. Um, Last three people. This guy called Frederick, German origin, built up a modest business of restaurants and hotels in Seattle, and also involved in um, hotels and hotels in inverted commas in the Klondike Gold Rush. Uh, mm -hmm. They were more like brothels than hotels. They had rooms for ladies, which is a uh, Normally, a sign that particularly uh, as the town uh, was full of men, it was uh, not normally uh, up for uh, real legitimate uses. Um, his whole family uh, contracted uh, the flu quite early on in America, and while out, out walking with his son Fred, a 12 year old son, he collapsed and he died the next day. Fred recovered from the flu and helped his widowed mother to build up a much bigger hotel and real estate empire. And in 1946, he had his fourth son in his name. <laughs> so if, 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 Fred, if, Fred, if Fred Trump had gone the same way as his father, there'd, there'd be no Donald. <laughs> <laughs> now we have this photograph uh, taken in, in German trenches in 19, uh, uh, well, in the, about 1916 actual photograph. Uh, this guy here with the, uh, with the cross above his head, um, he was serving on the Western Front in the summer of uh, 1918. His division was very badly hit by the first wave of the flu. It's not actually recorded where he whether he was one of the ones who succumbed to it uh, or, or contracted it. Um, but he was still around in, 19, uh, in October when the, the more severe uh, wave of the flu. But he was in hospital suffering from the effects of a gas attack which had temporarily blinded him. And so he survived the war. He then had a bit of a, a trim on his moustache, yeah. sort of moustache. And it's Trump again. It's got Trump again, yeah. <laughs> and the very last one, on a slightly lighter note, is this guy here. Um, he was, um, his two older brothers both joined, he's American, his two older brothers both um, signed up, one to the army, one to the navy. He wanted to sign up, but he was far too young. He heard that it was slightly easier to get into the ambulance corps, the ambulance corps 
Uh, but he still had to forge his uh, birth certificate, changed 1901 to 1900. But he managed to get in. He um, uh, went to a training camp to learn how to drive. He, he wasn't an actual ambulance orderly, he was basically an ambulance driver. But he had to do a mechanical course and a driving course, and he caught the flu. The rest of his uh, group went, was shipped over to Europe in the uh, beginning of October 19, uh, 1918. He, he stopped behind and was nursed by his, uh, by, his, by his parents, actually. And eventually, he, and they, he, he recovered from the flu, and he ended up in Europe, but not until December 1918, when the war was over. So he missed out, he didn't, he didn't die from the flu, he, didn't, uh, he wasn't caught up in any, uh, in any fighting either. Although he was, um, they, they would have been most time well back from the front line, there were still some casualties in, in these the original group that, uh, that went over um, the, in the month before the, uh, before the war finished. And you'll see a little drawing on these. He, he tended to decorate his, um, his, his um, um, ambulance with, uh, the, with little drawings. And his name? Walter Disney. <laughs> So, uh, as I say, he, um, he, he, didn't, he didn't actually end up in, um, in Europe uh, until December 1918, and he stopped there until September 1919, went back to America, uh, did various sort of um, artistic type things, and of course ended up as a cartoonist and is had up with the Disney Empire. And that's the end of the talk. <laughs> Do I know? Yeah, yeah. One, one little announcement. Um, right, I don't know if anyone here, I know some of the church goers here have probably been to loads and loads of harvest suppers here. But they're also quite, quite legendary. It's like a sort of um, bring and share supper. So you get food from all around the world, things like Brenda's um, quiche is legendary, as a uh, Pauline's cakes, which you probably sampled along the way. Um, and as part of it, we've been asked to do a quiz, like a fun quiz about Queen's Park. So those of you that have been to every single of our talks, every single <laughs> one, just a few of you still, um, you've got a very good chance of winning whatever the prize is. So it'll be a sort of fun and light-hearted quiz, just as part of that. And that's on Saturday, the 29th of September, half six, um, in the community centre next door. So if you remember the last Saturday in September, if you're not doing anything, no football on the telly, come along to that and bring a uh, bag of crisps or whatever, homemade stuff, whatever you like. Yeah, so you're all very welcome to come to that. The next talk you've all got leaflets for, which is another 100th anniversary of the, um, <coughs> the First World War, and it's looking at all the names that are on the memorial at the back <coughs> and tracing their lives and how they died and whatever. So thanks a lot for coming, hopefully it's stopped raining now, and looking forward to seeing you all again in November. Okay, thanks very much.